Before I read the text for the day, I'd like to thank uh, those who step in and take care of things when I'm not here. Last week, I had the invitation to go up to Murraysville First Church and preach uh, for a fellow that most of you probably know, uh, Chris Livermore, who was once the associate pastor here, serving there now. And for the second year in a row, they invited me to do their consecration Sunday, their consecration weekend uh, service. I got to pondering about that. Did that mean I did such a good job the first time they wanted me back? Or are they going to keep inviting me back till I get it right? You know, I'm not sure which way that works, but we had a nice time there. They had a good result from their stewardship effort. And uh, Kendra and some of uh, her volunteers went up and did uh, lunch for them, so it was a great day. Jim, Pastor Jim was here looking after things, and I'm sure he did a, a fine job as he always does. Jim and his family are away this weekend. They're in Philadelphia celebrating a family Thanksgiving there. Also, I want to say I hope you'll make plans Tuesday night to be at the community service down at Zion's Lutheran, just uh, down the street about a mile on the right. I don't know how else to say this. You know, our, our country was founded by people of faith, and in various ways uh, along the way they took measures to say we need to be thankful to God. The pilgrims that first winter instituted a feast to thank God for his provision and care. Abraham Lincoln decided that this country needed a national day, and, and he was the one that kind of solidified uh, what we call our modern celebration of thanksgiving. But now it's more about football and, and turkey, and I hope that you'll think about what Tuesday night represents Zion Lutheran Church should never be big enough to hold this whole region that should come together from all the congregations that are part of our ministerium. We should be looking to rent the high school auditorium next year. So I hope that if you have plans for Tuesday night that can be changed, that at 7 o'clock you'll gather with us down there and trust that it will be a fitting way in which we say thanks to God for all these mercies that God continually pours upon us and that we are truly thankful, and that is a way in which we can visually represent that thanksgiving. Well, I don't know. Did you know this is the last Sunday of the year? Did you know that? How many knew it's the end of the year? Well, it's the end of the Christian year. You know, we, the Christian year is a little bit out of sync with the calendar. Next week, it's hard for me to say this out loud, it's December 1st. It is the beginning of Advent. I don't know how many shopping days are left. I never worry about that till there are two. And then I say, oops, I better get busy. So we are going to step into a whole different direction starting next week, the journey that leads us through the time of remembering the announcement that God would send his presence in a redeeming way and that that's the celebration of Christmas, that, that child born in a manger in Bethlehem held with us the hopes of all humanity, that we cannot save ourselves and that God has acted on our behalf. And it's a, a celebration we love, and we've made it uh, so important. It's a, it's a cultural event. It's a worldwide event. But before we get to that point, we ought to remember why God acted as God acted. And so the church in its wisdom has, has called the last Sunday before the celebration of Advent, the end of the Christian year, Christ the King Sunday. God bless you. It is the time in which we recognize that if what the Bible is, says is true, it has tremendous and dramatic uh, portent for anyone who owns what God has revealed. We cannot live as others do, using St. Paul's words, uh, once we know what God has done. It becomes the focus and the center of the way we live our lives, the decisions we make, and the honoring ways in which we recognize that Jesus is not only the Son of God, as if that is not enough to say, that he is also the one who one day will completely rule all things, that when Jesus comes into his kingdom. So I want to read the text, which is odd for this time of year, as you think about preparing for Advent, why talk about the crucifixion? In your mind, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Because without Advent, there is no Christ to offer his life, but without the sacrifice on the cross, uh, 
his life has no meaning, at least in these redeeming ways. And so they are inextricably linked together. And again, the church in its wisdom over the years has said, be aware of what Advent really points toward. As you prepare for the coming of the Christ child, remember his coming was not what the Bible spoke most about. The Bible speaks about what it means that he has come, that he has taught us God's way, demonstrated God's power, and then taken upon him the sin of the world, and then in his death and in his resurrection given us a new life. This is found in Luke's Gospel. It is the 23rd chapter, verses are 33 through 43. Remember as you hear it today, this is for us the Word of God. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, this is again a time we invite you. Our lives are not yet what you would have them to be. We are reluctant and resistant in some ways, and perhaps in others we are simply ignorant. We pray that you would shine the light of your purpose into every corner of our hearts. And that which is pleasing and acceptable will be strengthened. And that which is misaligned and that which is unworthy would be set out. So, Father, we pray for this mercy in the spirit of the Holy One that we might receive that which you are anxious to give. In Christ we pray. Amen. If we believe what we say we believe at Christmas time, We believe the scriptures that really an unwed teenage girl was blessed with this anointing of the Holy Spirit that the child conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit and was the one who was to be named Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We kind of take that. I mean, we, we get used to that idea. Think about what that means. That the God of all creation, as the scripture details elsewhere, nothing was created without this Jesus. He was a part of the Trinity as we now describe it. From the foundation of the world, this one was present with God. And then as the scripture also says, but at the right time while we were yet sinners, God sent to us this child, vulnerable, human, and willing to experience all of life as we all experience. God with us. Jumping now, 33 years later, not the angels singing the good news of the birth of Jesus, but now jumping forward to this experience of of what the scriptures tell us. That this Jesus was not only obedient to represent God in all that he did, was not only the vehicle through which the power of God was demonstrated to heal all kinds of ills, even on several occasions to restore life to those who had died. How amazing and how stunning it is to stand in the presence of this miracle worker. 
But it was not about miracles. And it was not about these folks who were healed or even restored to life. It was about the sin that human nature and humankind bears in its heart. And that sin that must be in some way neutralized. It must be overcome. Something we cannot do for ourselves. And so God has made a way that this this son of the eternal one came into our midst and then willingly went to the cross. Reluctantly, but willing. And in his death, the sin that marks our separation from God now can be made right. Washed in the blood is the way we used to sing it in the old gospel song. On this Christ the King Sunday, we look at a man dying on the cross, bleeding, suffering, saying, King Jesus. Or do we step back and look at this bizarre scene and say, King Jesus? How can it be? After all, that's what the sign on the cross read that day. It said, King of the Jews. Words that were written not by another king, but a a man of great power. Remember, Pilate came before Jesus tried to interrogate him, and then finally, it appears in Scripture, he tried to get him off, but then he bowed to the pressures of the crowd. He wasn't a king, but he had a great deal of power, and he wrote these words as mockery. It was meant as a final insult. Remember the people of Israel, the Jews were a nation under oppression. They hated the Roman occupation, and even though they were subject to the great military power of Rome, they never acknowledged Roman authority. They would always say, we will never bow a knee to anyone but God. It's funny, in their defense, when they were trying to get Jesus put to death, at one point in John's gospel, in the 19th chapter, verse 5, the religious leader said, we have no king but Caesar. You talk about blasphemy. The day was accomplished, and Jesus was sentenced to death. This ultimate humiliation and mockery to this suffering, bleeding Jew named Jesus. And not many that would have come upon the scene that day would have said, Oh, the king of the the Jews, the king of the world, the king of creation. And yet that's what the Bible teaches us. In fact, before the story is over, and we hear the rest of what the story tells us in God's word, this crucified criminal, as they called him, becomes the king. He becomes the judge. He judges the mob. He judges Pilate. He judges all of us in the end of time. It's what the word tells us. We Christians believe that the greatest reversal in the world takes place in this moment when the sign becomes the truth. A dying criminal is really the king of creation. Jesus is king. Paul wrote it this way in the letter to the Colossians. In the first chapter, verse 19, in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. You think much about eternity? You know, in fact, if you have people over for Thanksgiving, try that line at the dinner table. So what do you people think happens after we die? You know, everybody has an opinion. But there's some basic denial in most human beings, in fact, in all of us, I believe, that, that tries to push that thought aside. That amazes me. One of my duties, I guess is the word, or my opportunities is another way to see it, that I'm invited into people's lives at critical moments. And the one that is most distressing to me is when there's a sudden death, especially a death at an unseemly time. Accidents take place. Illnesses suddenly rage up. Or in some other fashion, someone who we would have thought would have had a long time to live is suddenly taken from us, sometimes in an instant. Families are left struggling, and one of the things you keep hearing in those terrible moments is, we had plans. We had more time. We had things we were going to do. We were trying to accomplish these things. That always makes me think is that are we aware how close we are to stepping into the next world? How fragile life is and how none of us are guaranteed the next heartbeat or the next breath. And yet we live in some kind of denial. We always think there'll be more time. 
You know, I can get this taken care of. There, I have lots of time. I have weeks. I have months. I have years. I have decades. And one of these days, I'll get around to squaring things away, making sure that things are in order. There's a, an apocryphal story. My dad, who was a pastor, used to tell this story, and I remember it because of how disgusting it is. I've used it here before. You may remember it because of how disgusting it is. Would you like me to tell it to you? Well, I'm going to anyway. About an old Bedouin, you know, uh, a nomadic tribe in the Middle East. And the setting was to have been years ago, and the old man returned to his tent at the end of the day. Dusk was just following, and he was going to go in and have his supper. And so he went in and he lit the lamp, and that gave light in the tent, and he went and got his basket of figs that was to be his supper, and he took the first fig and broke it open in preparation to eat it, and he noticed that it had worms in it. Remember I said this is disgusting. So he threw it out of the tent, and he picked up the second fig, and he broke it open, and lo and behold, it was like the first. He tossed it away, and then he picked up the third, and now he was quite interested, and sure enough, so he threw it out, and then he blew out the lamp, and then he had his supper. Isn't that disgusting? Denial. The human capacity to deny the reality. And to just trust to luck or some other way. Somehow this thief on the cross, knew the moment of his death was rapidly approaching. He knew once you were placed on the cross, even though the other thief said, save yourself and save us, he went along with the rulers and the soldiers who were mocking these dying men, and especially Jesus. But this other thief somehow realized something important. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The day will come when Jesus is Lord of all creation. The fulfillment of what God has taught us in the word will come to pass. We may be living when Christ returns. It's possible. Christ could return at any time and history will come to an end and then the scripture tells us we will stand in God's judgment and Jesus is the judge. He is Lord over all. It's more likely, I suppose, since the Lord has not returned in these 2,000 years and some of us are not exactly youngsters, that we will experience death. But we don't know when. The thief on the cross knew it was imminent. And in that moment of clarity, he chose not to rail against Jesus as did the one thief, but rather turn to Jesus and saying, if you are the king, of the Jews. When you take up residence in your kingdom, remember me. Remember what Jesus said in response? Today you will be with me in paradise. The day will come when the creation is set right. The day will come when all scores are settled. The day will come when all sin is punished and all faith is honored. That day is coming. Hence the celebration in the Christian church, Christ the King Sunday. The man that was at this threshold used those words, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. You think much about eternity? This opportunity we have on Christ the King Sunday is this yearly opportunity to reflect upon the political and on the spiritual, on the the personal implications that one day we will be found in harmony with God's purposes or will be found in resistance to it. There are no other choices. We are either part of the kingdom or we are outside the kingdom. And it is a choice we make about that which we believe. I want to close the sermon by reading two other passages of Scripture. The first is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. This is a description 
of Jesus' mission. So here we are, Christ the King Sunday, and next week we begin talking about why God sent this vulnerable child into our midst. And I'm going to read this passage, chapter 2, verses 5 through 15, in two segments. The first segment is in a modern paraphrase by Eugene Peterson, because I like the way it reads. But I'm very committed to the more traditional language in verses 9 through 15, so that will be in the version of the Pew Bible. From second chapter of Philippians, listen for this word of God. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages that, of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, He set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredible, humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. The worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Now in the more traditional language. Therefore God has also highly exalted Jesus and given Jesus the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That day will come. Jesus' kingship is not in question. The day will be fulfilled just as all the promises of Scripture are fulfilled. And those that are found in faith are gathered into that eternal celebration of God's love. But those who reject it, who think they have time to get around to it, who one day intend to take care of it, may find that the time runs out. And they are cast away, outer darkness, a place of weeping and, wha- and na- weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth, a place of eternal torment, a place of fires that never go out. The Bible describes these places in various ways, and all of them highly negative. It's not the place we want to be. It's not the place God wants us to be. Well, I said I'd read two scriptures. The other is part I read before. I read part of that again. Colossians. I. I don't often read two of the scriptures of the lection, but today I could not leave this reading out. It is from the very first chapter of the letter that we call Colossians. Begins with verse 11 and reads through verse 20. Listen again for God's word. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Those clarion words of a man who was about to step from this world into eternity, recognizing that Jesus is what the sign said. And Jesus returned to him these words, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Pray with me. 
King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Father, as the hymn writer has said, may we today be thoughtful again about the importance of being committed to this one we name today as King Jesus. King of my life, I crown thee now. May these words be our own. And Lord, may your kingship reestablish in us a life that honors Christ, a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, a life that need not fear judgment, for we stand in the grace of the one who came and died and rose again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.